There were a ton of Kong films before the 1976 remake. That film was a less serious, more campy version of the 1933 original. It's noted as being Jessica Lange's first major lead role. In interviews for the 1976 film, the filmmakers wanted to remake the 33 film, but wanted to make it their own version completely different. What? So they had to take place in the modern day at the time and change the characters' names, but more importantly, the tone was different. Other than that, they're both pretty similar. Despite the camp factor, it was a huge hit. On a budget of 24 million, it made 90 million. So yeah, making a sequel, well, no, concerning the ending, it still wouldn't make any sense. The film came out in 1986, so I don't remember much about it before rewatching it this time. Apparently, me, my older brother, and our cousins saw this at the theater instead of 52 Pickup. Did we make the right decision? Let's find out. Okay, DEG produced the 76 film in this. Wait a minute, DEG as in Dino and DeLorenis? So which Dino is this? The Dead Zone, Serpico, Death Wish, and Flash Gordon Dino? Or the Mandingo, Dune, or Red Sonja Dingo? God damn it! The movie begins with how the last ended, with Kong taking Dawn up to the top of the world. He gets shot down, unfortunately. Imagine him thinking here, Ugh, I should have had V8. And yes, yes, it's very sad as we fade to black. Only to skip to 10 years later. Apparently Kong never died. He's just been kept alive for the last decade for reasons. Money, fame, mess, and the film doesn't tell us why at this point. Well, it seems Kong needs an artificial heart and a blood transfusion. We did segue to some unnamed island where some jerk adventurer is talking to his ass. I don't know why this film isn't giving us any reason why any of this is happening. This leads to the introduction of Lady Kong and a ridiculous chase scene. The jerk is saved by the knaves we never saw him interact with before, which leads him to making a deal with the hospital to send Lady Kong to the States. Question, how do they know he's not BSing them? As far as we know, no one has sent them any pics of Lady Kong. For all they know, he could just be full of crap. Well, Jerk A and Lady Kong arrive and we discover the origin of the resting bitch face. You could just feel the chemistry ignite between them. It's never a good sign when the two humans have less chemistry than the human and monkey. Anyway, over the next few minutes, we see Kong waiting for his blood transfusion and artificial heart. The entire scene takes five minutes. It's right here where we begin to see the big problem with the film. It's boring. Scenes are stretched beyond logical run times. There isn't any tension in the scene until about the fourth minute of it. Well, after the surgeries and success, we see people with champagne and gorilla masks celebrating. Uh, why? Within one minute, we jump from people celebrating in the streets to lay Kong in chains to an incapacitated Kong. Well, Kong wakes up to only, uh... He's not doing what I think he's doing, is he? Wait, now Lei Kong is doing the same thing? Oh well, he should have taken some Viagra. Then he would have lasted longer. The Science Club, Institute, Hospital, whatever, and military figure, the apes need to be further apart. Kong disagrees and breaks Lei Kong out. I will say that even though the action has either been lackluster or non-existent, this set piece is pretty good. The forced perspective and green screen isn't as noticeable and the other effects are passable. This leads us to the two humans trying to save the lovebirds. I'm not sure how. And the military trying to kill them. Why? We then cut to the lovebirds resting at Honeymoon Ridge. Really? Really now? That's a bit too on the nose there. Well, we spend the next few minutes watching Kong trying to get tenderly into Lady Kong's pants. First, it mistakes a snake for a pearl necklace. Then he tries to use his injury to get his swerve on. You know, I feel almost ashamed for saying that. Almost. Also, just look at that face he's giving. Yeah, there's nothing impure about that. Meanwhile, over the next several minutes, we see the dynamic duel getting shot at by the military, nearly fall down the waterfall, get naked, peeping on the Kongs, which leads us to... Oh well, when in Rome. Oh, for crying out loud, these two have the sexual chemistry of a marshmallow and a pickle. 
Whatever. The military catches up with the Kongs and they take out Lei Kong. I think. I mean, all apes look the same, right? That's racist. And what's Kong's feeling on this matter? Oh, hell no! He goes ham on them and the army runs away only to return to try to kill him. None of this makes any sense. Why capture one of them but not two? Why gas one down and then use lethal force on the other? Also, where on earth did this rainstorm come from so suddenly? Well, the dynamic duel gets captured and then released. Really, who cares anymore? Later on, Kong makes his way through the swamp and has a moment with a toad. And then he eats a gecko that the film tries to tell us is an alligator. I call shenanigans on that one. What's her name develops a Kong sense. Kong becomes a creeper 66 minutes into the film and I begin to question my ultimate purpose in life. Later on, a bunch of rednecks begin hunting Kong in a really bad green screen. They actually prove competent and catch him only to be again acting like movie rednecks and get what's coming to them. I gotta admit, this revenge scene is pretty awesome and hilarious. Apparently, rednecks have an extra spicy taste to them because Kong is having a severe case of heartburn. We learn from what's her name that Kong's heart is starting to give out. The reason she's been chasing him is she's able to fix it remotely via computer. Wait a minute, is this the first case of Wi-Fi? Whoops, well, I guess that's not gonna happen now. Anywho, the duel try to break the Lei Kong out, but it's kind of pointless since Kong does it himself. This leads us to a square dance. Wait, doesn't there supposed to be an evacuation happening? Why are these people still here? Is this a bootleg Billy Bob Thornton? Well, we did see a questionable looking Roy Schneider lookalike earlier. Okay, why can't anyone see, hear, or feel Kong approaching? Also, are any of my questions are going to get answered anytime soon? No? Fine. Okay, we're finally getting to the climax and Lei Kong collapses and it seems she's preggers. Wait, when did they have any time to have sex? Was it during the same time the dynamic duo were boinking themselves? If so, why didn't they see it? Don't get me wrong, I didn't want to see primate lovemaking. I'm just asking for um, uh, research, uh, yeah. So anyway, Kong protects her and finally takes care of the general. He then proceeds to do his best Fred Sanford impersonation. Before he dies, he gets to see his child born. Is it a boy or a girl? Well, it's Harambe. <laughs> King gets to see his son and holds him, then passes away. We then segue to back into the jungle with Lady Kong and Minnie Kong and Royal Kretz. Wow, that was abrupt. So no epilogue with the humans, no dialogue explain what the hell the point of this film or story was. So the army is just fine killing Kong, but not Lady Kong or Mitty. Fine, whatever, at least it's over now. This film was confounding. There are some really bad parts, but also some really great and admirable parts as well. But before I get to the good, let's go over the bad. The point of making this film didn't make any sense. The original Kong film, or heck, the 1976 remake were both done in one films. There wasn't anywhere else you could go with Kong believably. You could tell just by the way the film is paced, there isn't any decent or good reason on why he was kept alive. Special effects wise, a lot of times you can see the green screen. The main cast looked like they're standing in front of a projector. This crushes the illusion. The pace and the money shot scenes. Even though things are happening on the screen, this film just drags. You have two monsters, but you don't know what to do with them. A lot of times, they just sit around doing nothing, which is a problem. When you have monsters in a monster movie, you need to have them either fight each other or other, well, monsters. Having the military and a heart attack as the only antagonist doesn't fare well and it gets boring after a while. The chemistry of the human leads. I would be able to forgive a lot of this film's problems if I could believe in the relationship of the main human characters. The sex scenes seem to come out of nowhere since I didn't believe in their relationship by that point. I know John Ashton was supposed to be the Ahab character, but even his overbearingness in this part didn't help. He was supposed to capture both apes and not kill them, but he suddenly got a mat on for Kong before Kong even killed anyone. 
As for everyone else, all the other characters were just pretty bland. Now let's talk about some positives. The special effects at times. The use of miniatures, forced perspective, and just some really practical effects were good at times. Usually when the Kongs were supposed to go ape crazy, even though the budget was smaller than the 1976 one, they were able to stretch it in amazing ways. Just imagine if the apes hadn't fought against regular humans but were fighting against monsters or robots. The special effects team would have been able to go nuts and the film would have been 10 times better. The ape costumes. It's the best part of the film. Even after 30 years, they still look excellent. Also, it's pretty obvious that's where the most of the budget went. Because of that, the film keeps showing us the apes even when they aren't doing anything. In fact, the more better character development that we get in the film is from the apes than from any of the human characters. Which leads me to, believe it or not, when it comes to acting, the apes are better actors than the humans. Since the filmmakers seemed to be trying to stretch the film as long as they could, they were forced to focus on the burgeoning relationship with the Kongs. The Kong actors did have great chemistry. Any genuine emotion I got from the film came from any scene that involved the Kongs. The actors were able to pull off the funny, uncomfortable, romantic, and tragic moments as well. I can't recommend this film. Despite its positives, this is still a bad film that couldn't get focused on where it wanted to go and how to get there. This was an unnecessary sequel to a remake that many people largely forgot about. Also, no one was demanding for a sequel to the 76 film. It was tough to sit through this movie because for large portions, nothing interesting was happening. If you are going to have a monster movie, you need to have that monster go up against a threat equal to it. If Kong didn't have his heart element, then the military wouldn't have had a chance against him. Heck, even with it, they didn't have a chance against him. A bunch of rednecks were more successful and useful than they were. The only way I could recommend this film is, one, don't buy it. Watch it either on the internet or when it pops up on cable TV. Or two, with a, with a bunch of friends to riff on it with. Watching this alone in one scene will just make you go mad. Believe me, I know. Finally, I listed this as one of the forgotten films because most people don't know about this film. I'm sure people will point out how reviewers over the past couple of weeks prior to the recent Kong film reviewed or commented on this film, but did you know this film existed before then? And a couple of weeks after you watch Skull Island, are people ever going to talk about this film or remember it again? No. And that's why it's on this list. Ugh. You know, this is the fifth film I've reviewed and... Of all of them, there's only one that I would consider rewatching, and that's Friday Foster for reasons. I really need to find a film that's fun to review and watch and enjoy. Hmm. Dynamite. Nope. I can't seem to think of one right now. We can rebuild him. We have the technology.